This is the lecture for ancient and medieval history for Tuesday, the 6th of April, 2021. When we were here last, I introduced the notion of geographical isolation. And I started out with a very simple idea. Imagine that you and your community, your local community, was on its own. You were responsible for meeting all of your needs. Now, in America, we have a history of this. We went to the frontier, and uh, individual families would cut down trees and make a log cabin and then clear the land and make farms. And they had guns. Guns really help when you're clear, you know, doing things like that. They had factories back east that could provide them with good axes. So even the most mountain man type front frontiersmen still had access to items produced long distances away. And they depended upon muskets and rifles, which again, they probably didn't make themselves because making weapons, making firearms is not easy. So it's a bit like the American frontier, but more so. In a typical Anglo-Saxon village in England, there was a pit, a small pit, where everyone in the community would uh, urinate. And this urine might be covered. There might be a lid on the pit. There might not be. And so everyone who has to go and urinate goes to the pit and they do their business. And it's, it's there. It's sort of the village pit. Why? Well, it's not just for sanitary purposes. It's because the urine has the ability as a chemical to do certain things that they wanted done. So they, uh, there are people in the village who would actually then boil the urine and render it down into a paste, or they'd use it as a bleach or, or, or an ammonia. It was just, they'd use it. Why? Because they needed to. Because it did a job that nothing else in their world would do. What did they make their walls out of? Well, it was called wattle and dowel. What they would do is get little twigs, about yay thick, and they would weave them into like a net that goes back and forth around vertical struts. And that's the, uh, the wattle. It's this sort of wicker work. And when you had enough of it, they would daub on some clay, sometimes mixed with solid waste of humans and animals, sometimes not, depending upon the local conditions of the soil. And this stuff would go on like a thick, gooey paste. And they would cover both sides of the wattle with this doubt. And what it would produce is a wall. Is it going to keep out um, somebody who wants to use a giant axe? No. But is it going to keep out the elements? Yeah. These walls would hold in a bit of heat. They keep out the rain. What do you make your roof out of? You make your roof out of thatch which is a combination of grass and sticks woven together. So your home is built with local materials. You probably built it. You certainly have to keep it in repair because wattle and daub requires periodic maintenance. There are holes that appear. Damage is done. You accidentally knock a hole into it or something. You've got to fix that. And as to the thatched roof, You've got to keep it in repair, or otherwise it's going to leak, and you've got to replace it every few years because it just it absorbs moisture, and you, you have mold in it. And also, beneath it, you probably have a fire pit inside your home, uh, and the only way for the fire smoke to get out is through a little hole in the roof. So your thatched roof has a purposeful hole in it over the fire pit, and that makes it interesting when there's a driving rainstorm outside because some of the rain will get inside your home. 
And is a hole in the roof the most efficient way to get rid of smoke? No. So your home is going to be filled with smoke because what happens is instead of being drawn up like uh, in a fireplace, drawn up a flue into your into your chimney, um, the smoke's going to fill the, 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 the building and then leak out the roof. But it's still going to fill the building. So every night you're going to breathe some degree of, of, of wood smoke. Pottery is made by everyone locally. Weapons are going to be made or repaired by people locally. Everything from metal knives to the swords uh, that some noblemen use to spear tips, which is what most people use, to uh, short bows and arrows and eventually long bows and arrows. Everything's made by people in town. So what you eat is what you're able to hunt or fish or grow in your fields. And as to medical care, well, you have to rely on the skills of the people who are in your town. And you might have somebody who has more, you know, uh, fancy skills. Maybe you've got a monastery nearby. Maybe you've got some monks who have formal medical skill. But again, that'll end you up with maybe getting bled with leeches, or maybe you have an herbalist, or maybe you have a witch. You have a crazy witch woman in the countryside. She says prophecies. And she makes potions. And in the midst of Christianity, there's a belief in magic. It's widespread. And some faith healing and some magic healing actually can moderate the symptoms of certain conditions. But you're on your own. Now you may be part of a kingdom, but the truth is nobody's protecting your valley but you. If you're lucky, you've got a horse jockey, a nobleman of some kind, a warlord or a chieftain, and in return for protect protecting you from the bad people in the world, the warlord and the chieftain can do whatever he wants with you. He's going to take a proportion of your food as taxes. He's going to take a proportion of your labor in service to him. He's going to make sure that his warriors are fed and clothed and housed and uh, equipped by your workforce. And in return, they will guard and protect you. That's the deal. But in some places, a pre-Christian uh, system of prima nocter is established during the Middle Ages. Prima nocter is a bastardized form of Latin, which means first night. It's a custom that allows the nobleman in a local community to sleep with the bride on her wedding night in any marriage that takes place. He has first night privileges. Now, if you want to imagine the kind of law that makes people want to murder noblemen, that's the kind of law that makes people want to murder noblemen. Here you are, a newly married husband, a newly married wife, ready to start your life. You have a Christian marriage, but the nobleman gets to sleep with her on her first night. The child that may come may be yours or it may be his. But in return for protection and because these bully boys can kill anyone who looks at them sideways, they might have it. That's a custom that is usually frowned upon even by the nobility, but it was practiced in certain areas. And it was a sort of law that, that produced rebellions. But if an army comes out of the hills into the fields, you don't have an army. You, you've got a bunch of peasants with spears and a few guys who are local nobles. You're on your own. If there's a storm that comes in and flattens your buildings, if you have drought, and your crops are blighted. You're on your own. So the personal freedom from regulation and from government that's such a contrast with the late Roman Empire and that is such an appeal to modern people in our world of papers and paychecks comes at a price, and the price is you're on your own. You and the people you know are personally responsible for feeding, clothing, equipping, medically treating, every need that the people of this community have, including the spiritual needs of keeping people 
uh, in harmony with Christ. So, in the Dark Ages, when I talk about geographical isolation, I'm talking about something that goes beyond Europe being separated from most of the rest of the world. I'm talking about almost everyone living this way. There are no big cities in Europe anymore, not in Western Europe. Rome is a ruin occupied by a tiny proportion of the population that used to live there. So, you're on your own. Please understand that. Uh, that, is a, that is a characteristic of Dark Age Europe that you need to understand. Now, our Western civilization is born in this Dark Age. We're not Romans, exactly. We're descendants of Rome. We're not Greeks, certainly. We're descendants of Greece. We're not the same kind of Christians that established the Christian faith. And, and we're not Germanic barbarians anymore. We are heirs to all four of those traditions. The Greeks give us a sense of individual intellectual curiosity. They give us geometry. They give us uh, drama, comedy, tragedy, theater. The Greeks give us philosophy and democracy. They give us the knowledge that the world is round, which many people forget, but they still give it to us. The Greeks give us the notion that the mind of human beings is incredible. It should be cultivated. And creativity and imagination and mental gymnastics should be cultivated. And excellence should be cultivated. And hospitality should be practiced. The Romans give us a sense of law, proper law, effective law. They give us military science, how to organize your army. They give us a sense of uh, how you can have a free society that's more stable than democracy, which is republic. Um, and the Romans successfully rule a unified known world for half a millennia or more, depending upon where you are. The Romans do have a sense that citizens have rights and responsibilities. And Rome is the role model of the American Constitution. Not Athens, not Greece, but Rome is what the Founding Fathers looked to when they built the American Republic. Why? Because Rome's Republic lasts, again, about 500 years. So about twice as long as the American Republic has thus far lasted. We patterned ourselves on a very stable role model. Romans also give us our architecture, sanitation, clean water, sewage. The Christians give us the sense that every person is valuable because every person has the Spirit of God in them. If you treat someone badly, you're not just treating some moron, you're treating God badly. If you use somebody to satisfy your desires, you're not just raping some girl, you're raping somebody that has God in them. If you take somebody's hope away and turn them into a slave, if you break them to your will, you're not just doing it to a person who's weaker than you, mentally or physically or both, you're doing it to part of God. The idea that every person born, whether they're beautiful or ugly, smart or stupid, able or disabled, that everyone, even the slaves, have value because they have a bit of God in them. That comes to us from Christianity. And before that, from the Jewish faith. Because remember, Christianity comes out of Judaism. So the belief that we have that you matter as individuals, that you should be free, yeah, the Greeks come up with ideas, but the Romans make it happen. But the Christians provide the justification for it. Because the Christians say, people should be free because they have some God in them. And maybe God has a purpose for each purpose person. And if you make everyone into slaves, you're preventing God from working through the possibilities in each and every life. Why does your opinion matter? There are places in the world you could have been born into where you're basically a, a tool, a slave. Nobody cares what you think. Shut up, shut up and do what you're told. Do what the, uh, the wealthy and powerful make you do. 
the Christian faith, again, coming out of Judaism, to say no. To the extent you're abusing your fellow person, you're abusing God, and you're abusing God's trust, and God ultimately will judge you. You may get away with things in this world, but if there is an immortal life hereafter, you will face God's judgment. And God's judgment is not something that you can play games with. It's the truth. Capital T, capital T, the truth. And you each know when you're taking advantage of somebody. You each know it. It's something we all know when we're doing it. So the idea that we should treat each other with decency and respect, that's very much from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And finally, the Germans. What do the Germans give us? The Germans and Goths, the people who conquer Western Empire. They have a different idea of freedom. They're free men under the king. So first of all, as a free men, nobody tells them how to live their lives. They're kings of their own castle. They're masters of their own family. Nobody's going to tell me how to raise my kids. Nobody's going to have, tell me how to educate my kids. Nobody's going to tell me how to what's, what to believe. You know, I'll take them to church. The church, I guess, can tell me. But it's my life. I get to live it the way I want. I'll meet my responsibilities. I'll fulfill my duties. I will do my duty to church and state. But the condition for my loyalty is that you don't micromanage me. You don't act like mommy or daddy or big uncle brother. You let me be. You treat me like an adult. And if you do that, things will be fine. So the Germans work for kings, yeah. But they're free men under the king. They carry a spear for the king. Why? Because the king is going to protect their rights to property. The king is going to protect them from the other people of the world by organizing the war force that's going to be the, 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 the people armed and assembled, ready to fight, a militia, if you will. The king's going to make sure that nobody takes advantage of you using trickery or chicanery. The king is there to protect your rights as a man, your rights as a person. Now, they don't think of rights exactly the same way we do, but our sense of rights comes from the Germans. And our sense of freedom. When you first get a driver's license, you're going to have German-style freedom. The freedom of these Germanic tribes. Because when you have your driver's license, you're going to be able to go wherever you want if you can get your parents to agree and if you can pay the gas and maybe the insurance. Maybe the vehicle cost. Depends on your family. But you don't have to wait on somebody who's going to give you a ride. You don't have to go where other people are willing to take you. And you don't have to ride your bike halfway across town. You can drive. You can go where you want to go on your own schedule. If you want to bring friends along, you can bring them along. If you want to go to the store, you can go to the store. It's a form of freedom that's not political. It's personal. So that freedom that we have, that we take for granted... The freedom to live our lives without having to answer to somebody. The, the ability to run our homes the way we want. To, to, to choose how we're going to spend our free time. Um, to choose what we're going to do for a living. Who we're going to marry and where we're, we're going to live. All that stuff. That isn't just the political kind of freedom the, Greek, the Greeks and Romans were talking about. It's not the human dignity stuff the Christians are talking about. It's the kind of lifestyle freedom the Germans expect. German barbarians do not expect to be slaves. <clears throat> They expect to be free. And so that form of lifestyle freedom is something we expect and we insist on, and it comes from the Germans. Questions, comments, or thoughts about any of this before we move into the next section? Okay. Next section. Europe is a giant pocket. Geographically, it is a pocket. Let's see. We've gone over this perhaps, but I'm going to go over it again because it's important. Because this is part of the geographical isolation. Okay, you're going to have trouble seeing this. But I think if you look along in your maps, you can follow uh, what we're doing each and every. You may want to follow along on your maps because you're not going to be able to see this. So, 
Uh, you know what? Forget that. I'm going to stand behind you. So if you want to move, Mr. Dixon, you can. If you want to stay there, you can stay there. Just don't, don't be bothered by the looming. We're not really looming. So here's Europe. Here's Western Europe. Here's where Christendom is. Could you aim the uh, chair over here, please? Thank you. Okay. So uh, here we are. And if you're behind, you can move or whatever if you can't see. So here's Europe. Okay. How is Europe in a pocket? It's a continent. It's a. It's not even on its own. It's it's it's, it's part of Eurasia, Africa, a giant landmass. Well, here's how it's in a pocket. To the south is what feature? What is this feature? Africa. Well, it's not. It's in Africa, the continent. But what what feature is this big, bright, sandy area? Yeah. The Sahara Desert. Can you see how big it is? The Sahara Desert is very, 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 very big. It's actually larger than it seems on this map because of the projection that's used. The only people who can cross the Sahara are the Berbers who live in North Africa who know where the wells are, and they're not telling. So this might as well be a giant 300-foot wall of titanium razor wire with frickin' lasers on top, Okay. Nobody except the Berbers is going to go through Africa. The only way uh, south that is habitable is the Nile River. And the Nile River goes through some pretty nasty territory. It's not easy, and there are hostile tribes. So basically, this is the bottom of the pocket, the southern end of the Sahara Desert. What's this feature here to the west of Europe? Just say it. Loud. Three, two, one. The Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean. The thing about the Atlantic Ocean, unless you're a Viking, is that it's impassable. The European technology is so primitive that none of their ships can go deep into the ocean because they're too fragile and ungainly. The ships that Europeans have are good for the Mediterranean Sea, and they're good for the Baltic Sea, sort of, and the North Sea, and sort of the coastal waters around Europe. But you go big into the deep empty, and... Uh, the sea monsters will get you. That's what people thought. Because people who went into the Atlantic didn't come back. It was like they fell off the edge of the world. And again, a lot of people think that the world is flat now. The uneducated believe the world is flat. So out here in the Atlantic is a giant waterfall. It's the edge of the world. And if you go too far, if the sea monsters don't get you, you're going to fall off the edge. Ah, forever. So, this is a barrier. Now, eventually the Vikings cross the North Atlantic, but nobody believes them because they, they're usually drunk when they're talking about it. And besides, most people don't talk to Vikings because they're scary. Okay, what's here to the north of Europe? What region? Three, two, one. Arctic. Arctic sea. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Arctic. The Arctic! Arctic. You know what the Arctic is? It's cold. Water becomes ice. Ocean becomes ice cap. Icebergs. It's so bad that if you go outside, the skin will literally get burned by the wind and the cold. If you don't uh, bundle up properly, you'll die of hypothermia. Your body temperature will become so, so low that you literally will die because your core temperature goes below the safety limit and your organs will die. Nobody's getting through here. In fact, it isn't until the 1900s when we have airplanes and modern ships and modern guns and all the steam engines, all that stuff, that people first get to the North and South Pole. 1900s, just about 100 years ago. The Arctic is an impassable barrier. And that leaves the East, the Northeast and the Southeast. Let's look at the Northeast. It's the steppes of Russia. In fact, the North European plain stretches all the way to the Ural Mountains. And beyond the Ural Mountains are the plains of Siberia. Basically, with, a, with the exception of the Ural Mountains and a few mountains over here, there's a giant open field between the Spanish border and the Pacific Ocean. It's grassland. And grassland should be so easy to cross. You know, when I was a little kid, what we used to do, one of the things we used to do for fun, is we would roll around on the grass. We'd go to the top of a hillside, thank you, and uh, we'd roll down the hill. Whee! we get dizzy. Sometimes we get sick. We didn't really get sick. We stopped before that most of the time, I guess. But grass is so safe. 
It's even cushy. I mean, you could fall on the grass. You, you might not get hurt. So what could be safer than open grasslands? Yeah. Well, tundra is to the north of the grasslands. Uh, a lot of Siberian tundra basically is cold grasslands. You're right. Some of it's permafrosty. So the cold can be a problem in the wintertime especially, but it's still, I mean, it, it just, it, it almost begs, why don't the Europeans go deeper and deeper to the Sea of Grass? Sea of Grass, yes. Were there horse men there? Every sea and ocean has predators. The real ocean has tiger sharks and bull sharks and white sharks. Oh my! And despite finding Nemo, fish aren't the only food. People are food. Bull sharks go out of their way to kill people. So, if you go into the ocean, you have to mind the sharks and the barracudas and the killer whales and the electric eels and the poisonous snakes and the, the kingfish, I think they are, the really spiky and hyper poisonous, and the Portuguese man of war and the thousands of other predators that exist in the ocean. It's a scary place. Well, this sea of grass has human sharks in it, human predators. They're called Huns and Mongols and Magyars and, uh, and pastimes. Uh, they were called Sarmatians and Carpi and, and Bulgars. But what they are are horsemen. And these tribes of horsemen basically roam the grasslands looking for trouble. And if trouble appears, they capture it or kill it. Uh, or eat it. They're not really cannibalistic, most of them, but they wander looking for trouble. You know, most people in life try to avoid trouble, not these barbarians. The horse nomads of the rush of the steppes, now the Russian steppes, these, these rolling grasslands, that, that if you remember your geography, those are what steppes are. The rolling steppes of Russia are filled with these tribesmen. So you go in there, with a caravan of goods that you want to sell at the other side of the sea. Or you go in there with a, you know, with your peeps, you're with your people, sorry. You go in there with your human beings. Peeps, I can't believe I said that. And um, what's gonna happen is <laughs> uh, they'll they'll enslave you. If you're lucky, they'll enslave you. They might kill you. Or they might, for the fun of it, let you pass. So that maybe others like you will come along someday and they'll be able to exploit them. The steppes are actually incredibly hyper-dangerous. Even though it's just rolling black grasslands, geographically there's no problem, except winter. Um, the tribesmen of the grasslands make it impossible. In fact, the only time that that area is easy to cross in the history before modern times is when the Mongols, one of these tribes, takes over the whole area and makes it safe to travel because the Mongols run everything now. And if you mess with the Mongols, they'll bleed you so slow. Uh, on your way to die. Don't mess with the Mongols, it's scary people. So, um, the only way in and out of the pocket is through the southeast. And the southeast is the Middle East. Southeast of the European pocket is the only way in or out. Southeast of Europe is the Persian Empire. And later the Arabs, and before that the Parthians, and then the early Persian Empire. This is the only region that borders Europe that's civilized. So the only nation Rome had to worry about for centuries, the only organized country were the Parthians or the Persians. And if you want to go on roads protected by police and laws, uh, you could leave Roman lands, show the Persians you're not a problem, maybe that you'll even bring profit to their land, and go trading in Persia. And as long as the Persian government approves, you're, you're fine. But that's the only way in or out. The Europeans can't cross the ocean yet. They can't cross the desert. They can't go along the coast of Africa because of storms and currents. They can't go through the Arctic. They don't have the technology. They are isolated. They can't go into the steppes because of the horsemen. The only way in and out is through the Middle East. And this is going to be important later. And when long distance trade breaks down at the beginning of the Dark Ages, well, that's going to be a problem. It just further isolates. Now, in the Middle Ages, India and China also go get into isolated areas. 
Um, India, which had had some contact with China in the Middle East, becomes more isolated during its medieval period. China gets cut off from the rest of the world during its medieval period, for the most part. But Europe is the most isolated of all of them. Now, when the Muslims take over the Middle East, it's not going to be that isolated. But its contact with Europe is not going to be peaceful. It's going to be war. We'll get to all of that. We're starting on the Dark Ages. Dark Ages, the absence of the light of civilization. The Dark Ages, as you know, because I've gone over this definition many times, is when people forget the skills and habits of civilization. Why? Because they no longer matter. If you're in a society where everyone is just trying to feed themselves, being a sculptor won't work. You won't make a living at it. Being a teacher won't work. You won't make a living at it. Being an architect might work if you find a king wealthy enough to build a bunch, want to build a bunch of castles. But most of the highly skilled, highly technical jobs that make a civilized people advanced, yeah, I know it's weirdly photocopied, uh, most of that is the result of, um, is, is going to die off. And it takes generations. The first generation where the Dark Age begins or where the conquest happens, the sculptor is going to find other ways to make a living. But his son's only going to learn a little bit of sculpting. His grandson's going to learn even less of sculpting. The knowledge to make that kind of sculpture is going to go bye-bye. That's a Dark Age. When the skills and habits of civilization are forgotten. And in Western Europe, that's what largely happens. However, one of the lights of civilization, shedding light somewhat into Europe, is from the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And we're going to take a look at uh, its most successful emperor, Justinian and his wife, Theodora. And this will give you a, a hint of, of Byzantine culture. So there'll be other videos that you can look at below.